Good morning, everyone. <laughs> I'm Rajul Pandya Loj. I'm Director for Communications and Public Affairs at IFPRI, and I'm very pleased to welcome you to this special event on Reflections with Usman Badiane. As Usman leaves IFPRI at the end of February, and that is not a happy occasion, Usman, we would like to reflect on his work for Africa, for IFPRI, and for his numerous contributions to transforming Africa's agricultural sector. We are honored to have this conversation with Usman and warmly thank him for giving us this opportunity. Thank you to those of you who are joining us here today in person, to those of you around the world joining us live stream on multiple platforms, and to those of you who are going to be watching this video in the days and weeks to come. Let me introduce our speaker for today. Usman Badiani's contributions to transforming Africa's agricultural sector are widely recognized throughout the development community. As IFPRI's Director for Africa, Usman has significantly expanded IFPRI's engagement in Africa and has played a critical role in the transformation of Africa's agriculture and, and indeed of Africa's economies. He has played a key role in developing and guiding the implementation of the Comprehensive Africa Agriculture Development Program, well known as CADEP. His accomplishments include helping to establish the regional strategic analysis and knowledge support systems, the wonderful acronym of RESAX, a major collaboration between CG centers and leading African organizations to support evidence-based policy efforts, and his other accomplishments include launching and leading the African Growth and Development Policy Modeling Consortium, AgroDEP. His latest initiative, the Malabo Montpellier Panel, MAMO Panel, encourages policy innovations for better development outcomes by bringing together leading global and African experts and decision makers. I could spend the next hour telling you all about Usman, <laughs> but let's have a chance to have a conversation with Usman and then with all of you in the room and online. And with that, I'd like to begin with my first question, Usman. Usman, you are a native of Senegal. You have received your master's and PhD in agricultural economics from the University of Kiel in Germany. Will you share with us a bit of your background and how you made the decision to study in Germany from Senegal? Thank you, uh, thank you, Rajul, and thank you to everybody who is here, uh, the friends and colleagues who've worked with me uh, over the years. But you really couldn't get a better uh, combination than the uh, first DJ of IFPRI who hired me, <laughs> Dr. John Meller, and the uh, current DJ of IFPRI. So between those uh, uh, 30 and something years that I was at IFPRI to have them here uh, is, is really great, and many of the colleagues uh, here. So thank you very much uh, for this. How did I get to Germany? <laughs> um, I was born and raised in the groundnut basin, you would call it the peanut belt here in the U.S., uh, in Senegal. And in high school, uh, I majored in biology and math. And most of the kids uh, in that track either go to study medicine or pharmacy or, or agronomy. Uh, medicine and pharmacy were out of uh, question for me. It would take too long to make money to support the family, so it was probably agronomy. But then I was selected for a scholarship to go to France. Uh, before I finished my high school, if I were to make the, um, um, the high school diploma, at some point it didn't work. Uh, they gave it to somebody else whose parents were much more influential. And I went in there and I protested uh, and I was asked to come in. And I went to the uh, office and they gave me a form and they said, look, you can go and study anywhere you want in Europe, but you have five minutes to do that. <laughs> And then you'll be surprised, uh, in the 70s, the strongest soccer team in Europe was Borussia Mönchengladbach from Germany, <laughs> right? There you go. <laughs> then in 76, uh, Willy Brandt came to Senegal, who was then the chancellor from Germany. Both made really, really an impression on me. So, and I said, I'm going to go to Germany, okay? Uh, that's how it started. And I went down and I figured out, geez, you don't speak German. So I rushed back up again, and uh, uh, out of breath, I said, I have to change this, I have to change this, because I don't speak German. And the guy was just laughing, I said, don't worry, you know, you'll, you'll study German when you get there. So that's how it started. So uh, agronomy was there because of where I was born. Germany was because of a great soccer team and a great <laughs> chancellor. <laughs> 
powers of soccer for development careers. <laughs> so you started your career at IFPRI in 1989, and I remember we were at IFPRI together. I was in very young stages, and you had come, uh, I think, from your uh, background in Germany. You transitioned to the World Bank in 1998, and then you returned to IFPRI a decade later. What took you away from IFPRI, and what brought you back to IFPRI? Uh, it's, it's good. I was just referring to Dr. John Mello, who hired me from Germany uh, in August 89. Uh, and I started here uh, as a research fellow. I was uh, lucky enough I didn't have to go through the RAs and the postdoc. Uh, was a young uh, research fellow here. And after 10 years, I really plateaued here at IFPRI. I was too young to go into management, uh, division director's job, which was uh, uh, made possible for me as an option. But I couldn't imagine myself dealing with contracts and budgets and this kind of thing. So I just, I just couldn't do that. Then Hans Binswanger, late Hans, became uh, director at the World Bank, and he was looking for new blood basically, right? So he came and asked me uh, to join uh, the, the World Bank. So I decided to go, uh, although 10 years prior I could have been a young professional, but I thought it was too early to go to the bank. So when I was going, I said to myself, you know, you go to the World Bank and uh, you get $2 billion to Africa and you leave the bank. So that was basically my, my understanding. And that's very important. Uh, for me, if you're an American, you want to take money to Africa, you go to USAID to invest and support Africa. Uh, if you're British, maybe you go to DFED, right? If you're Senegalese, where do you go? So it's the World Bank, AFDB, and others, other places where you could do this. So I was very, very convinced. So if I can invest $2 billion in Africa with the World Bank, then it's time for me to go. And I failed terribly. Uh, I got promoted too early outside, out of project. So, but I still got to $200 million about uh, in my first three years. So, so I then came back uh, to IFPRI uh, on loan from the World Bank. Uh, one of uh, uh, John's uh, uh, successors and yours predecessors, Joachim von Braun, uh, signed an MOU with the African Union in 2003. And he called me and then said, look, um, we just signed uh, this MOU to support the African Union for the implementation of CADEP, the Comprehensive Africa Agriculture Development Program, and I want you to be the one to do it. I know you have the academic background with us and you've done some project management at the bank. And I said, I know it's a tough choice. Uh, you're at the World Bank, uh, uh, you know, up there. Uh, certainly good prospects. Uh, leaving that is not going to be easy. But if you tell me, get back to me in two weeks, that really would be great. Uh, and now I come to the reason why I really made the move. What he didn't know then is that CADEP for me, and before CADEP actually, or broader than CADEP, was the NEPAD initiative. African heads of state standing up and saying, where we are today has nothing to do with colonization, has nothing to do with the global world order, has nothing to do with anything else. We take responsibility, we're going to be accountable, we're going to change the way we do business, right? For me, that was amazing, okay? And when I was at the bank as an advisor to the WEP, I was the front person for CADEP, and I saw that the global community was not ready for an Africa that says, step back, let us put our agenda together, and then we work with you. Uh, there was zero credibility around the agenda. So, uh, and I said to myself, if I sit at the World Bank as a non-American, the best I could get is a VP for Africa. What can I do for Africa? Uh, if I can get the African Union and the 50-something member states to succeed in this endeavor and change the game, that is more than I could ever dreamt of at the bank. So, uh, that's what was going through my head, talking to Yakim. I said to him, look, Yakim, I don't need two weeks. I just need to talk to my wife, and I get back to you. So I, I, I went home, and, and, and I talked to my wife. She said, look, it's your professional life, really, and I trust you to do what you think is right. So I called Joachim the next day, and I said, I'm coming. So that's how it started. It's an amazing story, the, dev the developments in your life and your pro passion and inspiration for Africa. So that brings me to a question that you've partially answered, but let me give you an opportunity to reflect more on it. Where is this passion to work on and for Africa coming from? You know, um, if you started your career the time I did, uh, in the 80s and the 90s, any statistic you see around the world, Africa was at the bottom. Any graph you see going up, Africa was going down. Okay? But also, uh, you walk around, you see the people, you, know, you want things to change. Um, 
and in, you know you want to be part of that that movement uh, you know that this is is not a good given situation this can be changed can be turned around so what can you do with that so I had that sense of purpose uh, so much so that I really never really wanted to work anywhere else and I remember at the bank World Bank they wanted you to rotate to go. and I was saying to my manager if you ask me as an African, to go and work for any other region is just as if you're asking Senegal to give budgetary support to the United States, okay? So we need help of everybody in the world rather than giving help to anybody else. Let me do what I can do uh, and, and work for that. Uh, and so I did have that sense of uh, optimism that things could be turned around because I saw so much growing up that was being done wrong uh, in our countries, right? There was no wonder we were where we were. But I think that if we could change the way we're doing business, we'll be where everybody else is. I remember that so much from you, Usman, because I remember we were talking with you many times. You were always so positive, and I would be like, everything I'm seeing, where is that positiveness coming from? But that, I think, has been your hallmark, that always looking for the positive and building on that. But let me ask you, what do you say to people who do feel discouraged by these setbacks that we inevitably experience in Africa? You have, you have seen that over the years. Sure. What do you say to those people, and how do you bring them back? I think it's, it's uh, the first thing is to uh, question um, conventional wisdom, uh, to look at uh, things on the ground, uh, to look at uh, what's happening. Uh, you know, during most of my um, adult life and going to school in Senegal and everywhere else, uh, you always had one African country that did well. Could be a Botswana or a Cote d'Ivoire or you know Cameroon, but you never had a critical mass of African countries. All of them doing well for a sustained period of time. That's where we are right now. Okay, but also we need to understand a little bit the history. Uh, in the 60s uh, and 70s, there were difficulties. Uh, running African economies out of, for, because of two reasons. We had freedom fighters who were idealists, who wanted to get independence, but not economic managers. They didn't know how to manage an economy. They made a lot of mistakes. But also, even in the profession, we didn't understand how the economies work, how you transition from being agrarian to being an industrial economist. I'm talking here under the, uh, uh, in front of uh, Dr. John Mello, who was one of the first to show how agriculture development and industrialization link together. That wisdom never reached African countries, actually. If you look back, the debate about uh, development in Africa never talked about that complicated relationship between agriculture and industry. We wanted to industrialize. You had the government all over the place. So we didn't know how to run the economies. We made a lot of mistakes. That's why we landed where we landed. Ergo, if we corrected those mistakes, we should be in a different place. And that's where we are now. So what I'm saying to everybody who's looking at it is just look at the trajectory and look at the opportunities and look at the changes and the march is forward. Let me continue on that theme for a moment. <laughs> <laughs> Let me continue on that theme for a moment. Osman, where do you see as the key levers to transform Africa today and what are the opportunities that you'd want Africans to seize on? Okay. Very good, thank you. First of all, we have to continue the renewal process in the policy area, improving macroeconomic governance and sector governance. When I was growing up and going to high school, uh, it was illegal in Kenya to transport a bag of maize across the district line. Uh, our governments were telling the farmers when to, when to sell, to whom to sell, and at what price to sell. They're prohibiting our private sector operators to do any business with any farmers. Those things we have corrected a bit, we have created an opportunity for the private sector to get in there and to move. We have to continue that march. Uh, we have to uh, resist in an environment where we have a younger generation of leaders that is not really aware of the mistakes of the past because we don't have enough institutional memory. We're in an environment of political uh, popularism, poli I'm sorry, populism, populism and pluralism. So the pressures to go back to the old and failed policies are here, and the likelihood is probably higher. So I think we should resist that. Uh, Africa is going to go the same route the rest of the world has gone in terms of economic management. So that one is important. But second, we have opportunities that other developing countries didn't have 
which is the technological environment today present fewer barriers to us to leapfrog. Africa is now very competitive in telecom. Uh, we have to do the same thing uh, in biotechnology, which are the sciences of the future for agriculture, to master them, to harness them, to be able to deploy them for our uh, community. So if we continue to be at the cutting edge of emerging technologies, IT and biotechnology, and we continue to refine our policies and resist uh, what I call policy reversals to the failed practices of the past, we will continue our progress forward. Let me digress for a moment because those are very critical points you're making. And let me ask you um, an, a, a question on who will make this change happen? And what advice would you have for them? How do we nurture the young leaders of tomorrow? And as you say, avoid the mistakes of the past or the policy reversals and the like. And just talk a little bit more uh, for a moment about where do you see that next cadre and how do we nurture them? Thank you. And I think this is, has been really the center of our work here at IFPRI uh, around Africa. Um, I used to say to a lot of people, uh, if you go to a doctor's office uh, and uh, you don't have a lab report or anything else, uh, you go there twice and you want the same doctor to treat you, you're going to ask questions. Uh, and the lab report is about data. It's about evidence of what's wrong with you. It's about understanding your, state, your status and being, being able to, to deal with that. So uh, what we would need who's going to make this happen is if you start uh, uh, asking questions, uh, having the data we need, having the analysis we need, open the dialogue. Let the private sector, non-state actors, civil sector organization to be part of the, the discussion. You'll open the door for the young people to be part of, uh, of that. But anybody who is sitting in a position of responsibility today in Africa uh, ought to be a person who is there because of the qualification, because who is there because they have the expertise, and who is there who is looking for the best course of action. If you have that, it's not a president, it's not a prime minister, it's not a governor. It is everybody who has been entrusted with the responsibility to be accountable and therefore to measure, to track, and to improve the decision-making process. If you do that, you'll open up the environment for the younger generation and the older alike uh, to work and work towards excellence towards delivery. Let me continue on that theme of youth. You yourself got engaged in development work. What advice would you have for someone newly entering this field and building on that, and that enthusiasm? How do, you, how do you get them excited and motivated and stay on? What advice would you give them? For I'll give them the advice I gave myself 30-something uh, years ago when I started. So there's something different, different between uh, our field and let's say in engineering and physics and, and other sciences. I think um, an engineer or a physicist or, or, or a chemistry uh, uh, doctoral student is exposed to the cutting edge issues in the laboratory. By the time they leave, they're really strong in their field. In economics, our laboratory is out there. So when you leave, you're really very good raw material, but you're not yet really there, right? So what I would suggest and recommend to young uh, folks is what I did then, I could have stayed in Germany and worked with GIZ, I could have joined the World Bank as a young professional, but I put my eyes on IFPRI because I wanted to grow professionally. Okay. This is a place where you have John Mello, Mark Nerlov, uh, you had Yair Mundlak, uh, uh, Paulino da Costa, you have um, um, uh, friends from Argentina who were there. The, the, you know, the cream of the development policy economists were here. So there was no better place to go to grow. Right? That's why I decided actually to come to IFPRI. And I remember when I turned down the opportunity to go as a young professional to the bank, somebody close to me said, but Usman, you're nuts. The bank pays twice as IFPRI. Why are you doing this? <laughs> And I said, well, but the bank pays on the 15th and the 30th. I'm happy on two days. I'm miserable on 28 days of the month. So <laughs> th that is bad mathematics. I'm not going to do that. Okay. So, but I think if you're young in our field, find the best place to grow professionally. Surrounded by the like of the cadre you have here at IFPRI, you go to the laboratory of development in the field with them. They open your eyes and they equip you, and you can be much more productive in your professional life also, if you have anything you would like to accomplish in Africa, you'd be better equipped to do that. Here, here. <laughs> <laughs>
So, Usman, you are the 2015 laureate of the Africa Food Prize. You are a distinguished fellow of the African Association of Agricultural Economics. You are a member of the World Eco Academy of Sciences. You helped to establish, as I mentioned earlier, RESAX. You were instrumental in developing and guiding the implementation of CADEP. You launched AgroDEP, among other notable accomplishments. And as I said earlier, I can take an hour and read all the accomplishments. What are you most proud about and why? I'm, I'm not sure pride is the word, but where do I drive my most satisfaction uh, around this and where I'm the most grateful? Yeah. Uh, I think having the opportunity uh, to be able uh, to contribute uh, is, is, is not given to everybody. Having the platform and the support that I've had here uh, is not uh, given uh, to everybody. But also, in our lives, uh, often we forget, we always think that we get things done, right? There's even a book that I read here in my early years about getting things done. But you know, everything we do in life uh, is related to us having to be in one place at a given time, and other people taking certain actions and decisions at a given place, in a given time, and all that coalesces to lead to the outcome, the way we are. So it's really never, never what we do. But it's always about what everybody else and time and space play in what we do. So that's why I wouldn't call this taking pride, but being grateful and being satisfied that I had these opportunities uh, to be in a place at a time uh, that I could do this. If I, let's say, 20 years earlier, it was, would have been very hard for me to do much in Africa. Okay, uh, but perhaps 20 years later, I would have probably do greater things, or prob I wouldn't be needed, right? But I was, at that time, in the place where I could do things, and I'm very satisfied, and I take, uh, 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 I'm, I'm grateful that I had the opportunity to do that. Uh, being in Africa, helping the African uh, governments have a voice in the global development uh, agenda was very important. Having the world that was doubting the capacity, the willingness, and the result of African leaders to say, this is our agenda. Uh, I'm satisfied to see now that if you hear in the global discourse, which is now a given, country-owned, country-led strategies, it wasn't before Carib, right? So which is really a great thing. Uh, seeing African countries holding each other accountable. We just filed the second biennial review report at the African Union where countries are graded based on how they do, and heads of state accept it and see it. Uh, we have now countries asking for data, for analytics, and so on. So those are really great things that we could be satisfied about, right? And I hope we're going to see more of that. Usman, everybody I know is wondering the question that I'm going to ask you. <laughs> What's <laughs> next? Exactly. How this energy, this yeah. passion, this yeah. commitment, yeah. Usman, is not going to suddenly stop, I hope. Tell uh, us, what's, what's next? M most likely not. Um, I think there's really um, uh, a lot of resources that have come my way uh, over the last uh, 30 years or so. Just the IFPRI workforce, the experts, and the experience of IFPRI is one of that. But also the networks I have outside of IFPRI among the donor communities, the partnership, the collaborative frameworks in Africa from the African Union all the way to the farmers organization and the like. I think that's all uh, resources that could be mobilized, that could be used to continue to contribute. So what I think is going to change is nine to five is going to change. But I think uh, my interest uh, in uh, um, Building these coalitions, uh, getting IFPRI to work more in Africa, getting other centers to do it, getting the Africans to continue on this uh, march, uh, to going to refine our policies and not reverse uh, to some of those policies, uh, to uh, be a facilitator of an Africa that is open to new technologies, that embraces them, that can harness them. Uh, I'll be active on the ground, uh, and I definitely look forward to working uh, with a lot of people around here, but in particular, continuing a very, very strong partnership with IFPRI, which for me is the best place that you can work and contribute to Africa right now, okay? And has been over the last 30 years, that's why I've been here for so long. And I think that these times 
Africa needs IFPRI more than anybody else, and I'll make sure that I can work with IFPRI's management and my colleagues here to make sure we can deliver more and better for Africa. This one, all of us I know are very reassured that you will remain engaged in and for Africa. You know that you're not going to suddenly retire to your island and grow mangoes and disappear. Um, I know that we could continue this conversation, but I know there are many friends here in the room and online. So if you will permit me, Usman, let's open up the conversation to our colleagues over here. I'll take initially from the room some questions, comments, reflections, uh, memories, and pleas to Usman for how to continue the wonderful work that he's doing for all of us in Africa. Um, please give me an indication who'd like to speak. I see Marshall here. And if you'd like, my colleagues will bring mics to you. If you just give us an indication of who you are. Uh, let's begin, Drew, with Marshall in the second row. Usman, thank you so much uh, you. for all you've done. I'm Marshall Matz uh, with AGRA, um, and I've been working with them since they founded just over 10 years ago, commuting to Africa. I've caught the passion that you have. Um, here's my question to you, and a little more specifically, in addition to thanking you for helping start the organization. We're currently working on our 2030 plan. What's realistic? What do you think is a realistic goal for AGRA and Africa, um, because it's so linked, over the next 10 years. I share your optimism, but how do you quantify it? What's realistic? How many countries can be food secure in 10 years? Thank you. Do you wish to collect several questions or respond? Yeah, OK. Would you pass the mic thank then? You. Oh, you have a second question, no, Marshall. No, I'm just saying thank you. OK, okay. thank you, Marshall. Yeah. Marshall, the, to Julie, Julie right behind, behind you. you. Um, Julie Howard, I'm at the Center for Strategic and International Studies, and Usman, I want to thank you for all of your partnership over the years. You were so instrumental, I think, in getting the U.S. policies, U.S. foreign assistance to focus on country ownership and on CADAP. Thank you for that. So thank you for what you've done so far, and thank you in advance for what you will do in the next phase. Thank you. So my question is, you know, I see us, you know, with, with agriculture-led transformation, we're sort of at a, a, a pivot point uh, in, in Africa uh, where I see some of those gains now, many of those gains perhaps, being threatened by instability and conflict and climate change. So, um, and you know, as you know, the work with CADAP and the work that I did with, with helping to set up Feed the Future mm -hmm. really focused on, on, on the countries that were stable, more or less stable and had a government that was putting its hands up and saying, yes, we'll invest. And now the challenge, the challenge of hunger and development is really shifting to these unstable areas. So what would you say you know, are our priorities now in trying to work to stabilize these regions to make sure we don't lose the gains that we, what do we need to do differently now? Thanks. Thank you, Julie. Usman, I hope you take note that they are asking you the hard questions. I know. <laughs> um, let me, uh, for the easy one for exactly, you. exactly. I hope you will remember that. Um, let me pass the mic to Nicola. <laughs> Hi, Usman. Thank you so much, first of all. So I want to echo the thanks of others uh, who've already spoken and who I'm sure are already, uh, who are also going to speak. So I actually want to make a comment. Uh, my comment, for, uh, for those who don't know, I'm Nicola Dyer, and I worked at the World Bank for many years. And for the last few years that I was at the World Bank, I led the Global Agriculture and Food Security Program, or, or GASP. And I had the pleasure of working with you back in the 1990s, in the late 90s, when you joined the bank. And uh, we were in Gabon. I was in Gabon. I had opened the World Bank's office there and was working on the country assistance strategy, it was, as it was called, and had worked with us a stream of agriculture experts who are really focusing on projects and delivering money. So my comment to you is I actually think you really undersold your contribution while you were at the World Bank because my experience with you was that you didn't focus on the projectized approach. You did exactly what that country needed and you raised the level of dialogue to a strategic level. What is agriculture's contribution to the economy, to poverty reduction? And that was a kind of dialogue that wasn't happening in country. And I have a feeling that you did that in many other countries on the continent besides. So in addition to 
that hundred million that you so modestly mentioned. I actually think that you, by virtue of your strategic focus, help to channel an awful lot more resources and perhaps even more importantly, that were effectively spent because you can throw piles of money, but if <clears throat> they're just being shot against a wall without that strategic focus behind it, then it's not going to achieve the same kind of results. And fast forward, I would be remiss if I didn't mention your incredible contribution to GAFSP, which I was not fortunate to work with you on that, but I was fortunate to be able to see the results of it. The linking of CADAP to GAFSP so that GAFSP could actually channel those funds out to Africa. So instead of 100 million, I would say that you got at least 600 million out to Africa. <laughs> so congratulations. Thank you. Thank you, Nicola. Let me give Usman a chance to respond, and I'll come then to the online audience, if there is, and then to this side of the room. Thank you, uh, Marshall. Thanks for, for that question. Uh, it's going to be hard for me to say what AGRA ought to be doing. Uh, it's, it's a little bit uh, difficult uh, to do that in an audience like this without having discussed with them what their options are. But I do think that uh, we look at their track record, how strong they have been in the private sector, uh, helping develop uh, not just uh, businesses and entrepreneurs, but also working with countries in improving the regulatory environment uh, for private sector. I think that is an important field uh, that have, uh, they have uh, you know, achieved things that are respectable. Uh, they are now the main voice, agenda setting agency in Africa around policy. I think they should continue that uh, and to push it. Um, if I were to ask perhaps for an additional thing that I might want to do a little bit more is to try and um, galvanize the expertise in Africa and work with uh, the local expert centers to bring them in, cut them in to be part of the agenda setting and the discussion. Too many universities are on the sideline, uh, too many great centers of knowledge are on the sideline, and I think that they could probably uh, work on that a little bit more. But uh, the track record is solid, and, and I have no question they'll continue to be a driver uh, in Africa, absolutely. Yeah, I, I'll, I'll tell them. I talk to my sister very often, Agnes, so that is uh, very good. So, And I know her very, very well. She came back to Rwanda to head one of my projects when I was at the World Bank there, and we've known each other since then. She's a very capable woman, and I have no question that she will continue to lead that uh, very, very strongly and efficiently. Yeah, so um, Julie, you know, with that peace and stability, it's really, really, really hard um, to, because uh, you can destroy in one minute what you spent weeks and months and, and years building. So it's going to be tough. Um, perhaps uh, the more you get progress around the centers of uh, uh, instability, the more you can contain uh, the, pr the um, um, uh, propagation of instability while you're working uh, with security and uh, other you know, experts where you have zero uh, expertise, but they will know how to, you know, silence the guns, uh, get people to, to work together. In most of those countries, um, the um, uh, quote-unquote warring fractions have lived uh, together in peace for millennia. Whatever is going to oppose them now is a recent phenomenon. And because if it's recent, uh, maybe we can confront it and change it. But that's not my area of expertise. I think this uh, experts in security and, 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 and military issues should know how to solve that. If you don't, we're not going to have progress. It's just uh, impossible uh, to do that. But we can contain it by ensuring that progress is faster in places around it so it doesn't propagate that, that fast. Uh, nobody expected the Sahel to be uh, uh, a place of instability uh, 10 years ago or so. Uh, today, that's where we are. Um, the people who understand why and who will deal with that. But without that, we're going to unfortunately lose a lot of the progress we made and the momentum we have built uh, over the last few years. I hope it's, uh, we'll find a solution soon, and I'll pray <laughs> for that, that it happens. Thank you, Nicola, for, for the great um, uh, discussion. I, I remember... Uh, long and late debates you and I had uh, in Libreville. 
because of the complexity of the dossiers uh, that we wanted to resolve and the political pressures we were under. And I remember exactly how you're leading that office and uh, how uh, sometimes really, really frustrated uh, you were. Uh, and I think we ended up doing what was, res uh, was right uh, for the country. So thank you for that. Usman, I know there are hands in the room, but let me take over online questions and comments first. My colleague Lucy will read them out for us. Sure, uh, so we have two here. First one is Takalin Gutu, a postdoctoral researcher at Zunzung für Entwicklungsforschung, Center for Development Research, Ethiopia. Do you still think that agriculture is the way forward for Africa, especially when it comes to job creation for young people in the continent? I would like to hear your view on this. Thanks and wish you all the best ahead. And the second one is Karl Heinz Nickel from Germany and Italy. Is the global agricultural trade supporting or limiting agricultural development in Africa? How problematic are subsidized agricultural exports from the EU and elsewhere? Is there a sufficient level playing field? Thanks. Thank you, Sman. Okay. Very good. Thank you. Good questions, especially the, the first one. Um, between the 60s uh, and uh, the 90s, uh, a lot happened in Africa that changed a little bit uh, the model uh, uh, that uh, the classical economic development model uh, and brought a little bit of a twist to what we learned from uh, Dr. John Meller uh, and others uh, when we started here, which is if you have agriculture as a largest pool of low productivity labor, uh, and you have uh, a way of making sure that the emerging sectors become more productive and pull that labor, then you're growing the economy and you're growing uh, 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 incomes in agriculture. So in a context like that, in a dual economy model, agriculture versus non-agriculture in general, you can drive agriculture as a main uh, sector of development and uh, job creation uh, engine and income. What happened in Africa though, between the 60s and the 90s, is that agriculture failed and stagnated and declined and industry never took off. So the largest pool of low productivity labor in Africa today is the service sector the informal service sector, not, not agriculture primarily. So you no longer have the dual economy model we used to have, agriculture versus industry. You have agriculture, informal services sector, and industry. So therefore, agriculture alone is not going to get you there. I think there's a lot of potential in the informal service-oriented sector where you can faster and quickly raise incomes and productivity while you're also working on agriculture. It has to be a combination of both. Agriculture alone is going to give you uh, some impact, but it's not going to reach the masses of the low productivity and poor people around the urban areas and the secondary town. So they have to be a target of development policy as well. So the two-sector model changes a little bit, becomes a three-sector model. Uh, on uh, global trade uh, and subsidies and, and African uh, agriculture, uh, this is again a place where uh, conventional wisdom uh, has uh, disconnected a little bit from agriculture. Uh, with my colleagues from uh, Rob's uh, division and others, uh, we are publishing the African Agriculture Trade Monitor, uh, second edition, the third one coming now. But also the work that they're doing in general, uh, they look in depth at the conditions for agricultural uh, competitiveness, agricultural growth, and the environment for agricultural trade. It's true that you have issues in the global market, but what we have seen coming from the evidence is that the biggest constraints to trade performance in Africa's agricultural sector is related to Africa's specific factors. Uh, if you look at um, uh, the obstacles to exports and the obstacles to imports, intra-Africa non-tariff barriers are the biggest barrier to competitiveness. Of course, an uh, easier global environment is going to be easier for African countries, but for now, uh, the cost of doing business as an exporter, the cost of doing business as an importer, the regulatory environment, the policy issues are a bigger constraints to export competitiveness than subsidies from other countries right now. So if you work on that, we will maybe hitting a place where the subsidies and the distortions are more binding, but for now, 
fortunately, things we can change with a stroke of a pen around regulatory issues, the time it takes to get things through the ports, the fees and the taxes and all those different things, we can change overnight through a decree or, or regulatory uh, administrative movement. Those are the biggest barriers right now and uh, really low-hanging fruits that we could change and change quickly. And from your lips to Africa's policy leaders. Uh, let me come back to the room, and I know there were hands on this side. Um, Joyce first, Drew, if you could give the mic to Joyce in the third row, and then I'll come to Rob here. Thank you very much. Um, kudos to IFPRI to get uh, an hour of Usman's time to share with us um, his reflections. I will hold any um, complimentary uh, comments for maybe a, a, during lunch. Um, because I too could spend more than an hour talking about that. I've worked with Usman and the breath of fresh air of <clears throat> his comments again this morning of what is possible in Africa is greater than what is not possible is a spirit that I share with him and I've shared with him for a very long time. That explains that we've worked together on more than one occasion. At this moment, as you're reflecting um, and giving such wonderful guidance to all those that are hearing this, um, I really would appreciate your reflection on how now the capital markets development can play a role in bringing economies together and launching them forward. A rider to that question is the observation of innovation around telecommunications in Africa. What we are, we in the West amaze at with Venmo and PayPal and, 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 and all of those fintechs um, has been there in Africa, innovated in Africa, to the point where the IMF doesn't know whether or not they regulate uh, money transfers on th via telecoms and the central banks don't know and it, it's, a, it's a huge innovation, new industry that was created and the policy gap. I think that in, your, in responding, if you can focus on the fact that there's cash on the, in the ground, on the ground in Africa and how capital markets development can really bring Africans literally to own their future. Uh, thanks, uh, Usman. Always great listening to you. Uh, let me first start with a correction, what you said in the very beginning. At the time, the best soccer team in Europe was, of course, <laughs> my team, Ajax. Borussia <laughs> Mönchengladbach, come on. No. Um, <clears throat> but on a less serious note, um, <laughs> uh, when it, uh, we talk to people at USAID, they uh, often say, well, the thing they funded for RESAX and particularly the monitoring framework for CADAP and the Malabu Agreement is probably one of the greatest things they've done, and I guess thanks to you. Um, now, having said that, so w reflecting further on it, how good are these accountability frameworks, the Malabu ag Agreement, to actually push through the right kind of policies? You take the recent Africa Free, uh, Africa Continental Free Trade Agreement. Countries sign off on it, and the first next thing that happens is countries like Nigeria, they uh, restrict imports of food and agricultural products from neighboring countries. So how good are these agreements and accountability frameworks and reflecting what has happened with CADAP, how should we do things better moving forward? Thank you, Rob. And uh, Will Martin, you have also wanted to make a comment. The mic is coming Thank to you. you. Oh, yeah. Thanks Thanks very much. Thanks, Usman. A wonderful presentation. I think um, one of the credits you didn't claim, you know, after seeing you um, in Nanjing in the park, um, I th I'm sure that all of China's interest in Africa comes from your <laughs> magnetic personality and the response of the, uh, of the, of the audience. Um, but uh, more seriously, I mean, the demographic transition in Africa is proceeding quite differently or seems to be proceeding quite differently from, from many other regions. And I'm just wondering where you see the implications, uh, how you see that playing out and what you see the implications. Thank you. Thank you. 
Very good. Thank you. Um, <laughs> the capital markets uh, uh, and, uh, and um, uh, in Africa, uh, you know, now are the best times to invest in African economies in terms of, yes, you have the challenge, you have the risks and all of that. Uh, but also now is the best time for resource mobilization from within uh, the size of the middle uh, class in Africa uh, that has some uh, disposable income uh, that would uh, uh, allow a sizable savings rate uh, that you could uh, go ahead and mobilize. Incident, I was just reading the scorecard of one of the um, governments in Africa about you know the goals they have. It was the sixth edition, and uh, still you know working very hard to mobilize uh, domestic savings uh, and 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 the like. So um, capital is so scarce in Africa. It's going to be uh, uh, perhaps high risk, but the returns are going to be uh, very very good. For that, uh, I'm not a central banker. But I think we would have to look at um, uh, the banking sector more as a, uh, as a tool for development, for uh, um, uh, investment, uh, uh, mobilization, and savings uh, promotion. I tend to come from the francophone world, where the um, uh, tradition of banking is more like the banking sector of a developed country. It is keeping inflation low by any price and any cost. Uh, very, very low single-digit uh, inflation rates, which is good, uh, certainly from the inflation point of view. But are you tightening the capital markets too much? Are you starving the economy of cash and investments? So I think that um, um, so the uh, potential returns are there. How do you get sorted out the regulatory environment to get stability of whatever exposure? You, you remember the 80s, late 80s in Asia, how you can get some uh, sense in uh, capital flows to make sure that you know you don't get uh, people who hit and run uh, with capital uh, investment, but who want to be there in the longer run and make money and guarantee some stability. So it's not going to be one uh, formula for every country, but I think working on savings rates, getting an open capital market with safeguards to so guarantee stability will be important, and see banking as a tool for development, not just as a tool for low inflation at a low, very, very, you know, low single digits compared to developed countries, for example, when you're a developing country, could be a little bit higher. So I think that will be um, the short answer to that. How do you leverage fintech uh, to, to do that, right? You're right, Africa is a pioneer in that area. And I think uh, in fintech, we made more progress than in other sectors, but we still have though, a couple of issues we have to change uh, in the area of uh, telecom and IT. A is uh, the scalability of fintech uh, applications. Uh, it has to be something that could uh, uh, go beyond one local geography and want a value chain or a segment of a value chain. It has really to be able to go across value chains and cross sectors of the economy, maybe even across countries. That in Pesa and the waters in West Africa and others are really doing well. So when do we get to fintech that is scalable? Not just that shows the potential by solving a little issue here and there. Scalability is going to be an issue. Second, interoperability of these platforms. If they operate in silos, you're losing a lot, right? So when you put those platforms, uh, government should come in with the regulatory uh, frameworks and the support and the engagement to ensure that they're interoperable. That solves also your problem of scalability as well. So we have to deal with that, which is uh, quite quite an issue, okay? So, um, um, uh, Rob, um, uh, the question was on... Uh, Oh, yeah, exactly, the accountability issues, right. So she was saying at the beginning the inevitable setbacks. You're going to have them here and there. It's not going to be linear. It's not going to be smooth. We'll be bumping, losing a little bit, and then catching a little bit, losing again. But I think the direction is what's important. That Nigeria signed it is very important. You have a tool now to hold them accountable to, to change that. Uh, but we're a long way from uh, 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 enforcement and implementation of it. The modalities haven't been worked out yet. Uh, the implementation rules, uh, the instrument, there are a lot of things that need to be worked out. Uh, but I have no doubt that the environment for trade is going to be better. Just because of the cost of not doing so are going to be so palpable. Nigeria is now struggling also with some of uh, the um, implication of the trade measures. So I think between uh, the voices that will ask for accountability, 
and the implication of bad uh, behavior will keep us on that trajectory, although we may lose altitude from time to time in one place or the other. But I think we'll, we'll be doing, doing very well. Yeah. Yeah. You know, um, it's a challenge, uh, as we know, but also it's, it's a huge potential. Uh, younger people, uh, especially what I uh, see uh, in Africa, but also somewhere uh, outside, are much more flexible, much more open to new ideas, uh, much more um, uh, uh, willing to, to take risk uh, because they look for what they tend to be also more optimistic uh, than the, the older generation. But how do you create a space for them economically and politically is a challenge, uh, obviously. Uh, and at the heart of that is the education systems. My biggest concern is a lot of African countries is what education system do you have for the youth, right? Um, are you training them for the jobs and the skills of the future? Are you training them uh, for uh, classical uh, um, uh, skills that uh, are important for society at large, uh, but uh, less demanded in the modern workplace, for example, uh, or at least get a balance on it? And thirdly, where you see big gap, where you really need to invest to leverage uh, the youth, is a question I often ask. If I had, uh, you had a 17-year-old that says, Dad, I want to be a modern farmer, uh, where do you send him or her to go to get trained? They want you to go to high school, to go to college, to go to university, get a degree before you be a farmer. Uh, or if you started farming or you're among the millions of farmers that are there, there's no way you can get uh, opportunity to upgrade your skills, to build your skills. So one way to use the use bulge and make it productive is to invest in a systematic way in professional and vocational training to allow those youth to acquire skills they could put to use right now. And we have the least investment in professional and educational training that is directed to the youth and the mass. It's directed to the specialist and there's always going to be a minority. So education, skills building, skills upgrading, uh, skills development is going to be extremely important in using uh, the, uh, uh, the youth dividend. If you don't do that, uh, it's going to be long, it's going to take a lot of while, and I think the weight of that is going to exceed the, um, uh, the contribution of that. Ma'am, thank you. I understand we have two quick online comments. Let's hear them, and then we'll come back to the room. Yes. Um, so the first one is Nasul Kabunga, who worked at IFBRI from 2012 to 2019. Usman, you have been a shining star for Africa and for IFPRI. Africa is wailing, so hoping this is not the time to abandon us in the trenches. <laughs> As a former IFPRI staff, you are a great inspiration. And the second one is Jimbi Kuvuna from the DR Congo. Hello, Usman. Just wanted to let you know that we are proud of you. There is a new wave of young African entrepreneurs in agriculture. So how can you be a mentor to them? Thanks. Okay. Uh, brief response <laughs> and then come back to the room. Okay, very good. No, I'm not going to abandon you in the trenches. Um, I've always been in the trenches, so, uh, and my boots will, will remain dirty. Uh, don't worry. Uh, I'll be there uh, uh, with you. Um, the, the young entrepreneurs are, are great, just not in, in agriculture. But uh, if you look at where agriculture is today uh, in Africa, and among those young entrepreneurs, I actually have my younger sister, uh, the rise of the processing sector is the biggest, most uh, important trend you have in Africa's agriculture. And it is dominated by young folks. Okay. Of course, we also have the, the younger entrepreneurs in ag tech and in fintech and other areas, but also in, in, in processing. I think um, beyond the mentorship you're talking about, um, I, having the institutional framework to support these young entrepreneurs uh, to have access to uh, technology for both process and product innovation, to have access to financing and mentorship for enterpr uh, enterprise creation and growth, uh, for expansion and maturi maturation of the, uh, uh, the firms that they're creating. That is what is required uh, to make sure that the youth can become important levers of uh, economic transformation in, in agriculture. Uh, otherwise, what we can do for the younger generation, there's a discussion, the question from DRC, uh, is to continue to do our best to show that um, uh, first there's uh, positive change taking place in Africa, that we can be part of that, and whatever there is positive change, there, there's a room to learn, 
uh, to scale up and to replicate. Uh, and we hope that uh, you will seize the opportunities that are being created uh, in your countries respectively uh, to, to be entrepreneurs, to take risks, to invest, to manage and to grow, but commit to excellence uh, in your products, in your processes and how you deal uh, with the rest of the value chain actors. Asman, I know that all of us would want to continue the conversation with you, but I have two more speakers that I will call on one by one, and then I know that at lunchtime all the compliments will come your way. <laughs> but um, let me ask our Director General, Yo Swinnan. Drew, if you'd bring the mic up to Yo. And Yo, you're not the last speaker. There's one more after you. Thank you very much, Rajul. Um, <clears throat> well, what can I say after both your uh, everything you said and all, every, all the comments that came from, from the room. Uh, I think uh, the Q&A here was very inspirational, just the way I understand that you have been for much of Africa, and I think for many of the researchers, both in IFPI and beyond, who have worked on Africa. Um, I have, I will actually, one thing which hasn't been done, I'll thank a few people. <coughs> so these are, and I had to dig really deep in my memory for this, Bertie Vogts, Gunter Netzer, Paul Breitner and Joop Heinkes. <laughs> <laughs> For those who don't, those were the stars of Borussia Mönchengladbach. <laughs> <in the net. laughs> this was not prepared, so I have to. I'm very proud of myself that I can recall. <clears throat> um, the other thing is what uh, I want to mention is that you know in economics we, uh, in empirical economics today, we struggle a lot with the differences between. With identification issues, okay, the difference between causality and correlation. So I hope there is a distinct difference there because the first thing Usman told me when uh, he learned that I became the new director general was, I'm leaving IFPRI. <laughs> 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 and uh, so I hope this is pure uh, correlation. Uh, <laughs> so but then he went on to tell me essentially the same things he told us today, that basically his heart is still with Africa, with African development, with the work that IFPRI does, and that he would be around to support the research and the work that IFPRI does in different ways than you have done before. And I really hope we can count on you. I'm sure we will, okay? And so uh, I also like the way you express that history matters, but history matters to draw uh, lessons from it, the right lessons, and not to basically cause some sense of, of intellectual stagnation, that policy matters, things can be changed, as you uh, very well described, and that things can, if you change policy, it, it basically makes a difference for welfare and for economic growth and poverty reduction, etc. So I hope very much uh, that uh, Africa has a great future and that if we can contribute to that, and you've made tremendous contributions in our work in the past, and I hope we can continue to collaborate. Thank you so much. So, Osman, before I give you a chance to make your final remarks, let me call on my colleague, Sid Sima Kombe, Senior Program Manager at IFPRI, oh. and uh, oh. she has a few things for you. Thank you, Raju. Well, Usman, on behalf of the IFPRI Africa office, it is my great pleasure to present you with a small token of thanks. It includes farewell messages from your staff, colleagues here at IFPRI, also farewell messages from partners, from friends, mentees, and people that you've inspired throughout your journey of contributing to Africa's agricultural development. So thank you very much, Osman. Thank you. No, Osman, I give you a chance to give your not final, but almost final <laughs> reflections, words okay. for all of us. Okay. Uh, thank you very much uh, to everybody. As I said, um, uh, what we achieve in life is really not uh, just us. It's not even primarily us. It's the time and space and who else is in that time and space. Uh, far or uh, very close, they're, they're part of it. Uh, you may wake up with your plans and intentions, but your action depends on somebody else's action. Uh, you know, therefore, it's really uh, something that goes around. So you're lucky, uh, you're grateful that you hit the right space, the right time, and then the right action is being taken place in the other part. So many of you have been part of that uh, environment, so thank you for it. Uh, it, is, it, is, it is great. I uh, thank also for John for having, you know, uh, had the 
the trust in a young graduate uh, from the University of Kiel, and uh, so welcome. I remember when I started uh, with a 24 months contract, and uh, half a year through it, and John said, not look, Osman, we just change this as a regular contract, three year contract. That's what we usually do here as a research fellow, so we, we take that away. So thank you for the trust and, and for that uh, openness to do that. Uh, thank you, Yo. Uh, I mean, uh, for me, if it has all been about Africa, it's really uh, not if pre primarily, but it was the best place to contribute. And it's still the best place uh, to contribute. What I commit myself to do is to enhance the relationships on the ground for IFPRI, to broaden the networks, to solidify uh, the partnership so that we can even be a greater contributor to Africa's development and changes. So thank you to everybody who's come here. A lot of people haven't seen for a long time. Uh, we are here, and thank you very much. It really means a lot to me. So, and uh, as I said, I'm not going anywhere. I'll be around, and I look forward to seeing all of you and working with all of you. Thank you. Felix. Please join me in thanking Usman and paying tribute to him. <laughs>